Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome to the class. Um, oh. uh, today is the second part of lecture two. You're going to learn all about timekeeping and how the sun moves across the sky and how we keep calendars based on the motion of the sun and stars. And then we're going to have a pretty gnarly homework session today. Uh, today's homework number two is going to be pretty intense. So hang on to your hats. A reminder to the class to make sure that you are following along with me when you do your homework. Do not try to do it on your own. It doesn't work out so well. A few people have discovered that. There's a reason why I do the homework with you to make sure that you, you get the right answers. <clears throat> okay. So uh, today we're going to talk about timekeeping. And let's start by thinking about where our 24-hour day comes from. Where do we get our 24-hour day? What's the rise and fall of the sun? Right. We we chart the path of the sun, and we call this solar time. Uh, let's get a slide up for us to look at. I think maybe we could start off um, with uh, with a picture of a sundial. Uh, might be kind of fun. Is is a sort of thing to think about. So uh, F520. <clears throat> Um, an old-fashioned method of keeping track of time would be to use a sundial. The sundial has a dais, and this structure right here um, goes by the name of a nomen. I like this, G-N, nomen. That's a funny word. A nomen is the sort of stick that casts the shadow on a sundial. And it might not be obvious to you guys, but the the sundial has to be constructed for a particular latitude on Earth. You'll never guess it, but that nomen is pointing up towards Polaris, the North Celestial Pole. What would be the angle of the nomen if we did it for Providence, Rhode Island, students? 42 degrees. Excellent, Kim, 42 degrees, because she learned that the altitude of Polaris is equal to your latitude. As the sun travels through the sky, for a northern hemisphere observer, the sun will travel through the southern part of the sky, and the shadow of the stick will basically move across the hours as the sun moves through the sky. And this is something called apparent solar time. You're keeping time directly by the motion of the sun. I've got a couple of different cartoon pictures of that, so let me share them with you. This diagram is extremely helpful it shows us the path of the sun on three different days of the year. Actually, four different days of the year. The middle path here is the path of the sun on the spring equinox and the fall equinox when the sun travels the path of the celestial equator. Uh, the path here, which is 23.5 degrees above that celestial equator, is the path of the sun on the summer solstice around July 21st. And then down here, we have the path of the sun on the winter solstice, 23.5 degrees below the celestial equator. The reason for this is remember that each day the sun travels uh, along the ecliptic by about one degree. Do I have a picture of the ecliptic here? So the sun relative to the celestial equator is either on the celestial equator each day it drifts a little bit north of the celestial equator for a while, and then it drifts a little bit south of the celestial equator for a while. On any one particular day, the sun sits at one of these points, kind of like a pin the tail on the donkey. And as the sun is pinned to one of these points, the earth will rotate underneath it, and that creates the rising and the setting of the sun. When we keep time by the motions of the sun, we call it apparent solar time. And it's actually a little bit different than the mechanical times that we keep on our iPhones and our pocket watches. If anyone actually still uses a pocket watch, I doubt that very much. But mechanical time is something a little bit different. <clears throat> and that's because, get this, the rate that the sun moves through the sky is not constant every day, but the rate that the sun travels through the sky differs from day to day. One way you can see this is by taking a photograph of the sun every day at noon 
relative to your mechanical iPhone pocket watch. Let's look at slide 25. It's actually kind of a cool astro photo. Some intrepid astronomer has gone out and has pointed their camera south at noon, maybe every two or three days, maybe every week or so for an entire year. I didn't actually count the number of images here. And what you can see is that if you take a picture of the sun at the same time each day, like noon, the sun is not always in the same place. Sometimes it's close to your meridian or on the meridian. At other times, it can be a little bit behind or a little bit ahead of the meridian, depending on the day. This is a legendary shape. This path, this sort of shape that the sun makes over the course of a year is known as an analemma. And an analemma is, is a shape that we use to describe what's called the equation of time. The equation of time helps us keep our mechanical watches. This can all get a bit confusing, so let's take some notes. <clears throat> let's start off by defining something called, um, so we're going to do a subject today called astrometry. Astrometry is a branch of astronomy that deals with clocks, calendars, timekeepings, and positions. And it is not at all simple stuff. It's quite complicated. You have to know a lot about astronomy. Um, just a moment, guys, while I call up my Logitech control center. I'm having some focus issues. So uh, that's, that seems to have fixed my focus issues. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define astrometry simply as astronomy for timekeeping. And there are actually uh, professional astronomers whose job it is to maintain calendars, clocks and other such things. Let's start off by defining something called apparent solar time. Simply put, apparent solar time is keeping um, time by a sundial. And when we keep time by a sundial, we're basically tracking the motion of the sun. The problem with the parent solar time is it's not, how should I put it, constant. The length of a day and the length of an hour differs depending upon what time of year you're observing the sun. Now that might be fine if you're just doing some backyard gardening, but if you wanna keep track of a complicated mechanized industrial society where worker droids punch into their amazon.prime uh, warehouses to maintain this flow of packages, you obviously don't want to be paying your workers for varying amounts of, of time. You want to have things well-regulated. Plus you need to be able to meet your friends after work for beers because you're so unhappy with your day job or something like that, okay? So let's take a look at why this equation of time uh, happens or this, this, this path of the sun changes. You'll notice that the figure eight is not symmetrical, but it's a bit wider at the bottom and it's a bit narrower at the top. And you can see that the photographer has left the camera shutter open on three very unique days. This day is most likely which day class, can you tell me? What day is this first one here, number one? Definitely one of the equinoxes or uh, the solstices. Um, well, considering that the sun is higher in the sky, Ian, what would be your best guess? I was about to say my guess would be summer. Exactly. How about position number two here? What day do you think that is? Um, the Both the equinoxes. Spring or fall, one of those. And yeah. that would make down here number three, the winter solstice, right? Yep. Now, it might not be obvious why the sun drifts across the sky at different rates, 
There's two complicated reasons for it, and I'll try to give it to you as simple as possible. One is that the orbit of the Earth around the sun is not a perfect uniform circle, but as you discovered last class, or sorry, as you'll discover next class, uh, next week, the path of the Earth is an ellipse, and it travels a bit faster when it's close to the sun and a bit slower when it's farther from the sun. That will affect the length of your day. The other reason has to do with geometry. When you're at one of the equinoxes, the Earth has this configuration relative to the sun, which is currently your, your, my camera. During the day, as Earth moves, the sun will actually have a slightly north to south component to its motion. That will change the diagonal that the sun moves across the sky. Meanwhile, if the Earth is moving around the sun during the course of one day at one of the equinoxes, the drag on the sun is completely east to west. And this slows the rate that the sun makes during the day while the Earth is spinning. Are you confused? Well, good. You're supposed to be confused. It's not easy stuff. All you got to know is that the sun has a varying rate that it travels through the sky because of some quirks with the orbit of Earth. In order to keep uniform time, someone has to go and calculate the average rate that the sun travels through the sky. And usually what they do is they kind of map out the sun's analemma and they calculate the maximum drift of the sun forward or backwards, which turns out to be about 20 minutes. And then they basically invent a mechanical clock that keeps time by the average motion of the sun so that the average length of a day is about the same over the course of a year. When we do this, we construct something called, wait for it, mean solar time. And mean solar time is the time that we all collectively keep on our iPhones, on our computers, and on our watches. Mean solar time is what we base the start time of our class on. And mean solar time is constructed so that at 12 noon, the sun will approximately be on your meridian to within a maximum or minimum of 20 minutes, because that's the, that's the maximum drag that the sun can have. So let us define mean solar time. Mean solar time is time by a watch. or time by a mechanical clock. You keep this time, unless you are like some kind of primitive nomad who lives on the steps of, I don't know, uh, Mongolia, and you keep time by a sun tile. You probably keep, uh, I'm sure even the Mongolians today keep me in solar time. You, uh, you keep this time. Okay. The importance of mean solar time is that mean solar time has a 24 hour day, more on that in a bit, and uh, each, the hours are uniform. Mean solar time and apparent solar time, both of these depend upon your longitude. Let's make a note about that. Both of these depend on your longitude. And that's because the time that the sun will cross your local meridian will depend upon, you know, what part of the earth you're on as it rotates. In the olden days, when people didn't travel much outside of their towns, you would have some Swiss clockmaker in every town who would have a sort of Big Ben clock and they would have to calculate mean solar time and set the time for your local area. And then everyone would synchronize their watches to Big Ben or whatever clock tower was in your community. But as people began traveling over longer, longer longitudes, especially with the advent of railroads crisscrossing the United States, we started to realize that it wasn't helpful for every town or village to keep their own mean solar time because things would get confusing. For instance, um, 
if you were going to take a train ride and you were going to go from Providence, Rhode Island out to Los Angeles, maybe in 1846 or something like that, you would cross through many different towns comprising many different longitudes, perhaps in a single day. And then you would need to have a mean solar clock time for each longitude or each city that you went through. And believe it or not, the motivation to keep universal time was that train schedules were getting confusing because you'd be leaving Providence at, you know, 3.45 p.m. and you'd be arriving in Columbus, Ohio at uh, whatever, 8 p.m. But Columbus, Ohio time, it would be 7 p.m. and things would start to get a little bit confusing. So at first, the railroad barons devised something called standard time and they blocked out these sort of four blocks. You guys are familiar with them probably. Eastern Standard Time, Central Standard Time, Mountain and Pacific Time. And the rest of the world eventually followed suit and they invented something called universal time. Universal time keeps the mean solar time of the prime meridian at Greenwich, England, and then measures all the other uh, local clocks in, in 15 degree wedges uh, around the entire globe. Do you guys remember what the significance of 15 degrees is? Why 15 degrees? Ian, you're muted. I was popping my ears, <laughs> sorry. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, let's do some good remembering here. The earth, as you remember, spins 360 degrees in a 24 hour period. What do you get when you divide those two numbers? If 15. You, oh, pardon? Uh, 15 degrees per an hour. Good, and those are the right units. I like the moves. 15 degrees per hour. Not only is one hour of time a 15 degree rotation of the sky, one hour of time is also a 15 degree wedge of longitude. This is our conversion factor. We'll need it in our homeworks today. You can say one hour is 15 degrees of sky rotation or earth longitude, whichever you'd like. <clears throat> okay, so now let's define something called universal time. Universal time is the mean solar time, the mechanical watch time of the prime meridian. Where is the prime meridian class? Greenwich, England. Yep, of the prime meridian. Um, sometimes in the military, uh, they refer to it as Zulu time, right, Jonathan? Uh, or they might call it uh, GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. So I'm a fan of the BBC, and I don't know if he's still a newscaster, but it used to be that Owen Bennett Jones would come on and say, it's 1300 hours GMT at Bush House. And so he was in Bush House, London, telling you the, the local solar time of uh, Greenwich, England. So they call it GMT, which is Greenwich Mean Time. And since the military has to conduct complex operations covering many lines of longitude, they use universal time and they call it Zulu time. Same thing. I thought I would just mention that for the military buffs out there. At least I think that's what they do. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. It's Michael. Um, what about like like on mechanical or automatic watches where you have like a GMT? What is that? Um, the, they'll, sometimes it's helpful to have a mechanical watch that will keep track of... Greenwich Mean Time. What could be the usefulness of it? Well, it's kind of classy and cool if you're a nerd uh, like me. Uh, another reason, as you're going to discover in today's class, if you know, if you know the time in Greenwich, England, you can compute your longitude based on the time of day. That's one of the things I want to teach you how to do. For instance, in other words, it's classy, it's cool, and it's informative if you have to do something crazy and complex. Okay. Um, let me erase down here and let's see how that works. Do you guys remember what the longitude uh, of Providence, Rhode Island is? Do 
That'd be kind of nice if you knew your longitude. It could be way off, but I think someone said it earlier. Was it like 42.5? That's 42 degrees north is your latitude. Ah, OK. Open up your compass app on your iPhone. Uh, it's 71 degrees west. Excellent. Who said that? Valentina. Valentina, thank you very much. Um, so let's check this out, Valentina and friends. Um, if we do 71 degrees, and let's do some dimensional analysis here. Let's convert from degrees to hours. What's our conversion factor? What number should I put top and bottom? Oh, you guys are sleepy today, huh? One degree equals 15, uh, one hour equals 15 degrees. Good. Now go ahead and divide those two numbers and tell me what you get. Well, come on guys, punching is a you job, not a me job. 4.73 hours. Good, or approximately five hours. And this is why Eastern Standard Time is universal time minus five hours, because we are roughly 71 degrees across uh, or five hours off from Greenwich, England. Um, so this means that the world is broken up into what are called time zones. Uh, and each time zone is a 15 degree or a one hour wedge. I'll tell you some interesting things about time zones. Um, for Eastern Standard Time, I can't remember which city but they usually pick a city in the middle of the wedge and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Eastern standard time is based on Philadelphia. So because Philadelphia is kind of in the middle of this Eastern standard time wedge, they choose your, so the clock that you keep right now, Eastern standard time is actually more like the, the mean solar time of Philadelphia than it is Providence. So the sun might actually be off from the meridian at noon by even more than 20 minutes because of that. If you went to Philadelphia, that would be the best correspondence between the path of the sun and the local time. You'd like to make it so that the sun is at your meridian at noon. That's how you want things to be. Kind of like a sundial, but everyone's organized. I'd like to point out that not everybody is on board with universal time uh, for political reasons. Some places keep large swaths of time that, that do their own thing. Uh, you'll notice that for some reasons, uh, time zones will sometimes wiggle around borders. Do you guys know what the, the, the longitude on the opposite side of Earth is called away from the prime meridian? Did we talk about that? What do we call the longitude line on the other side of the prime meridian? Longitude 180. No, no one knows. It's called the international date line. And the international date line sets the boundary between like Tuesday and Wednesday. If you fly from Japan to California, you might actually go back a day if you're going against the rotation of Earth. Fun facts, who'd have thought it, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so universal time is something that we're gonna be using uh, in our homeworks today. It's the mean solar time of the prime meridian. And we're based on 15 degree wedges. So this would suggest that the time it takes Earth to spin once on its axis is, take it away class. Twenty four hours. Right. Except what if I told you that that's not right? It's actually not true. The Earth does not spin once on its axis in 24 hours. You've been lied to all your life. The amount of time that it takes Earth to spin on its axis is 23 hours and 56 minutes. Four minutes short, this is four, four minutes short of a solar day. 
That's because Isn't that where we had leap year. Uh, no, the leap year thing is coming. Stay tuned on that. That has to do with the number of days to go around the sun. So this is something that you probably have never even heard of before, despite the fact that it's kind of, well, happening every day. There are two types of day, one called a solar day and one called a sidereal day. And the reason for the difference is uh, function F53 is because <clears throat> The Earth, while it spins during the course of a day, so Earth is spinning counterclockwise, right? But the Earth doesn't stop moving around the sun during a single day. Earth continues to move about one degree along the path of the ecliptic during a day. Let's say that you're an observer standing here on Earth with your local meridian pointing towards the sun, which is, of course, 12 noon. That's when the sun's on your local meridian. As Earth spins around the sun, it's spinning counterclockwise, but it's also orbiting the sun counterclockwise. By the time the Earth completes a full 360 degree spin, your meridian will be pointing back towards the left hand side of the screen. But look, you're no longer pointing towards the sun because you've moved a little bit in your orbit and you're not pointing your meridian back towards the sun. That means it's not quite noon where you are located. You've got to rotate an extra four minutes to get the sun back to your meridian, and that completes a solar day. Nuts. Let's take some notes on this, because this could be confusing. OK, so there are two types of day. The one that you're familiar with, because let's face it, you're more interested in the rotations of the sun than the rotation of Earth. You keep uh, a solar day. A solar day is um, a 24 hour clock. And a solar day is also the time for the sun to, how should we put this? Let's start by saying the time for the sun to orbit the sky. And what it means for the sun to orbit the sky means to cross your meridian twice. Once at the start of the day and once at the end of the day. Actually, we don't keep the start of a 24 hour clock. Okay, now it's time to talk about the term meridian. You guys, well, actually, do you guys remember what the hell the meridian is? I don't even know. What's the meridian? Tell me what the meridian is. Ah, see, I thought I was talking to a bunch of enlightened people. Go ahead, Jenna. The arc that rises due north and reaches zenith and sets due south. Which is this arch that I just drew right here, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is technically called your zenith meridian. Because this meridian, which goes north to south, passes through this point, your zenith. What if I told you there was another type of meridian? There's something called the nadir meridian. Okay, remember that the celestial, the celestial sphere extends below your horizon to the parts of the sky that you can't see. The point that is opposite of the zenith, basically the point that goes right through the floor, through the center of Earth, and out the other side of the Earth, that part of the sky is known as the nadir. This is some old fashioned astronomy terms. The meridian that goes below the sky is known as the nadir meridian. Each day, the sun will cross the zenith meridian and the nadir meridian as it travels around the sky. Class, do we begin our 24-hour clock when the sun crosses the zenith meridian? Or do we 
begin our 24-hour clock when the sun crosses the nadir meridian, which is true. I'm, I'm maybe the nadir. Yeah, what, what time is it when the sun is on the nadir meridian, roughly? Well. That's vague, that's ambiguous. Well, 12 a.m. 12 a.m. This is midnight, right? So this is 12 a.m., but up here is 12 p.m. So I'd like you guys to notice that we begin, we designed our day to begin when the sun crosses the nadir meridian, not the zenith meridian. Okay, now let's talk about the other type of day. The other type of day is called a sidereal day. A sidereal day is 23 hours and 56 minutes, four minutes short of a solar day. Basically, the sidereal day is the true 360 degree spin of Earth. Here's another weird thing. The solar day is the time for the sun to orbit the sky, but it turns out the sidereal day is the time for a star to orbit the sky. No kidding. And any other star besides the sun. The reason for this is that the stars are so infinitely far away that the puny little orbit of Earth doesn't even matter in comparison to their distance. In other words, this is gonna seem a little weird because of the geometry here. Do you see this arrow here? If this arrow points to a distant star, like the star Betelgeuse, if you spin a full 23, 56 minutes later, this arrow also points to the star Betelgeuse. And that's because the star Betelgeuse is so far away that anything that points to the left kind of points towards the star Betelgeuse. Let's say you don't believe me because honestly, that might take some supporting evidence. Take a look at the geometry using my whiteboard here. Let's put the sun as a little circular, circular dot over here. Relative to the sun, the orbit of Earth is really damn tiny. Oh, sorry, relative to the, sorry, let me try that again. Relative to the background stars, the orbit of Earth is really damn tiny. So let's put a star somewhere over here, okay? If that star gets farther and farther and farther away, it doesn't matter if you're here or you're here in your orbit, all of those arrows basically point towards the star because the star is, uh, I probably could have done this a little better. Let's try that star again. Let's put it like, wait, ooh, shoot. All right, I screwed up. How do, what? Okay, hopefully you got the, uh, okay, Jesus. <laughs> um, as that star's distance goes to infinity, all of the lines that are parallel to each other will point towards those star. I don't know. Hopefully, if you, if you don't believe me, then just take my word for it, okay? If you don't understand it, rather, take my word for it. We keep a solar day because we're interested in the motion of the sun, probably because we need sunlight to go out and plant our crops in our gardens and in our fields. But what if you were an astronomer and you literally made your money off the stars? You might want to keep a different type of time. Instead of keeping time by the sun, you just might be crazy enough to keep time by the stars. And let me introduce you to something called local sidereal time, okay? Does everyone have this stuff written down? All right. One of our problems in homework today deals with something called local sidereal time. It's gonna take a minute to get through that, so let's define that. So. Um, I'm going to erase. I'm assuming everyone's got all this. Okay. 
introducing time by the stars. This is useful for astronomers. It's known as local sidereal time. Local sidereal time has a kind of confusing definition. I'm going to have to define some things here. It's known as the hour angle. Isn't that the, um, the time that comes like a little bit before it's a full day? Like it's like 2352 or something like that? Uh, it's 2356, Aaron. Oh, okay. So wait, did you just join the class or were you here for the beginning? Time? Yeah, I was in Spanish. Oh, Sorry. that's okay. Yeah, so Aaron, um, the, the notes that I had just erased in the board, I had told the class that the Earth spins on its axis in 23 hours and 56 minutes. That's so, what it was. Okay. So basically, astronomers are interested in local sidereal time because if you're out at a telescope, you're usually trying to plan out the things that you're going to observe. Like you might want to observe Betelgeuse on a particular night. And you have to know when Betelgeuse is going to rise when it will be at your meridian and when it will set and when it will be the most advantageous time to watch it. It's way more easy to kind of look at your watch and say, okay, if I'm keeping sidereal time, this is how many hours until Betelgeuse rises or sets. It's one of the reasons you're learning it, but it's also to give you an idea that you can keep time by something other than the sun if you decide that you want to. It's sort of up to you, the human, to decide how you want to run time. Okay. Okay. So the definition of local sidereal time is the hour angle of the spring equinox. And if I were you guys, I'd be saying, what the hell does that mean? Um, let's go ahead and draw a picture for you guys to sort of follow along here. Um, we're gonna make another two dimensional local sky. Give yourself quite a bit of headroom. My <laughs> uh, ruler here. <laughs> So go down about halfway or so. And I like to suggest once again, you make about a 10 centimeter line on the page and mark the midpoint, mark the midpoint of that line, okay? Uh, I, I did badly here, let me get it right there. And now I want you to kind of make another line or make another dot about five centimeters above the middle and go ahead and just kind of freehand draw a dome as best you can. Honestly, I could have done that a little better. I'm gonna make a few, uh, a few different points. You guys can make them all at about uh, five centimeters. This will just help me draw a slightly better dome. Okay. Now, unlike the two dimensional local sky we did before, we're gonna do this as an east to west diagram so we can watch a star rotate across the sky. I like to have my stars rotating in the same direction as a clock. So I'm gonna put east on the left-hand side and west on the right-hand side. And that means the observer is standing in a field and they're basically if you're the observer, you're looking south right now, all right? So towards the board is north and into the board is south. Um, let's go ahead and let's draw in, well, what does this line point to? What do we call this point? The zenith. We did call it the zenith. Was that Kim? Oh, no, it's Jenna. Oh, sorry, Jenna. Jenna, we did call that the zenith when we made a north to south diagram. But here I need to tell you something a little more complicated, so bear with me. Oops, that's not what I want. Uh, I want to share my screen. Um, remember that I showed you guys a diagram like this before, showing you the rotation of stars across the sky here. That arrow does not point towards our zenith because we want it to be kind of general for any star in the sky. Now, yes, there are some stars 
whose orbit will take them right across the zenith. But that's the very rare case of a star who's at this declination. Most stars rotate and cross the meridian at their highest point in the sky. And the circle that we're drawing on the board represents one of these colored rings. Let's pretend it represents the celestial equator. Stars will rise in the east and set in the west, and they'll cross your meridian at their highest journey. So because we're doing an east to west cross section, and we're not trying to specify which place we're at, this is going to represent our meridian, not our zenith. Does everyone understand the, the difference there? Just pretend you do. OK. So um, in that case, let me start by putting a star somewhere on the local sky. I'm going to put it about 15 degrees west of the meridian. I hope that's 15 degrees, probably close. Can you guys tell me how long ago that star crossed my meridian? If I tell you that that star is 15 degrees off from the meridian. Uh, An hour? Yeah. Yeah. How did you know that? 15 degrees equals one hour. Sorry, guys. 15 degrees equals one hour. Correct. Actually, that's pretty darn close to 15 degrees. OK. What if we just keep it generic here? And I'm going to define what you just talked about as the hour angle of the star. I'm going to abbreviate it as HA. And here's the definition of hour angle. HA stands for the hour angle. And it's basically just a way of keeping track of the position of a star in hours. Our angle means time since the meridian. For instance, the hour angle of the blue star here is one hour. OK? Usually, if you're on the meridian, you're zero hours. And when you spin around the sky, you're 24 hours, OK? Technically, the star spins around in 2356 minutes. But they don't want to start getting people confused. So they basically redefine an hour as a, a fraction of th uh, 23 hours and 56 minutes. Don't ask too many questions, OK? All right. Um, <clears throat> now, I'd like to remind you guys that we had to choose one of the stars in the sky to be the basis for local sidereal time. Astronomers decided that it wouldn't be fair to play favorites and choose one star over another star, and that perhaps a better object to choose would be the spring equinox itself. Remember, there's usually no star at the spring equinox. It's just an empty point on the sky in the constellation of Pisces. The spring equinox is a point on the sky. It's the point where the celestial equator and the ecliptic intersect. It's one of the points where they intersect. And it's the place where the sun is on March 21st, OK? This is the dot that we are going to use to keep local sidereal time. Let's say on this particular day, I'll use green for the spring equinox. And let's say that the spring equinox happened to be located, I don't know, right about here. Can you guys tell me what the hour angle of the spring equinox is? Can you guess it in this configuration? Someone give me a reasonable guess as to what the hour angle of the spring equinox is. Like 45 degrees? Hold on. Our angles are measured in hours. Ian. Oh, that's my yeah, first correction. Okay, sorry. So, and it's definitely not forty-five degrees because that would be halfway through the sky. Yeah. Um, about seven hours. Fuck no. What this is zero hours. A quarter turn around the sky is six hours. So I'm looking for an answer. Sorry about my language. I'm looking for an answer between zero and six. Four. Yeah. Okay. 
this is what we call the local sidereal time. The local sidereal time is the hour angle of the spring equinox. And in this particular cartoon example, the local sidereal time is four hours. One last thing, believe it or not, we can also put the right ascension of a star onto this diagram. But in order to do that, I need you guys to remember what the hell right ascension means. And I'm already 100% sure you've forgotten. So let's go back and regurgitate the definition out of our notebooks. What does the right ascension mean? I'll put it over here. <clears throat> hours and minutes measured eastward from the spring equinox. It's hours. Let's keep, let's shorten that to an even more digestible sound bite. It's the hours east of the spring equinox. So who just read that to me? Beauty. Beauty. Could you try to guesstimate for me what the right ascension of the blue star is? How many hours east from the spring equinox is the blue star in this configuration? So let's go slow, Yudi. What direction is east on the sky? Which direction do we measure east in in, in, in space on the sky? Um. Would it be clockwise? No. East is counterclockwise. Okay. And look, Yudi, you can see it. If you're here, you're west. If you travel counterclockwise, you're going east, right? OK. Mm -hmm. So how many hours eastward of the spring equinox is that star? Mm. I have no idea, to be honest with you. Does anyone have an idea? It will be three hours. How did you know it was three? Let's explain that to Yudi. So if the star is one hour, and from one to the equinox, you have four. You do the four minus the one. And that's three hours. Nicely done. You see that now, Yudi? OK, yeah? Okay. Yeah. So four hours minus one hour is three hours. Uh, who answered that question there? Who was that that I was just listening to? Valentina. Valentina, you just did some math. And there's an equation to describe the math that you just did. We're going to use it in our homeworks today. You might think of it as another part of the definition of sidereal time. It's a formula that goes like this. The hour angle of a star is the local sidereal time minus the right ascension. I call this formula ha equals list minus ra. That's how I remember it. Ha equals list minus ra. Would you guys like to try a sample problem? and see how this works? Because students find this wicked confusing the first time around. All right, Ian says, let's do it. Uh, Jonathan, let me know when I can erase here. You're good? All right, I'm gonna erase everyone. Um, it's, what time is it? 12.47? Let's make it 12.45. It says 12.52 for me. Oh, okay. It's 12.52 p.m. on, what is it, February 3rd? Nope. 
what is the local sidereal time? Okay, let's start with our formula here. Pa equals list minus ra. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange the equation and solve for the local sidereal time. To do that, I will add right ascension to both sides. And I will get a new formula. LST equals the right ascension plus the hour angle. Let's first deal with the right ascension. You guys might remember that we had to move the sun around my celestial globe to estimate its right ascension. I'm going to cheat. I could use the celestial globe, but I'm just going to look up the right ascension. Uh, I'm going to do that by going to a website that's called ephemeris.com. I usually just type in sun to Sedna. And um, the sun today has the right ascension of 21 hours and 10 minutes. So let's say I know the right ascension of the sun is 21 hours and 10 minutes. You guys will remember that last class, it was right on the nose, like 21 hours and three minutes. The sun usually moves by about four minutes per day along the uh, ecliptic path. Once again, that four minutes is because of the difference between solar time and sidereal time. Okay, if only we knew the hour angle of the sun. Hmm. What is, does anyone know what the hour angle of the sun is right now? How would I know what the hour angle of the sun was? I guess I'd have to know how many hours and minutes ago it crossed my meridian. I bet that no one be, can figure that out, right? That would be at noon, right? So if we're rounding up, it would be about an hour. So but let's just go with 52 minutes because we're being, in fact, Ian, do you know what PM stands for? Uh, post meridian. Exactly. Local time, AM and PM, is the hour angle of the sun. That's what's going on here. So the hour angle of the sun is just zero hours in 52 minutes. Okay, let's add them up, keeping track of our hours and minutes separately. The local sidereal time will be the right ascension, 2110, plus the hour angle. 60 minutes is an hour, so this will give me 22 hours and two minutes. Did you all see that? Class, is the spring equinox up in our sky right now? Or is it below our sky? Below our horizon, rather. Hello? How'd you figure that out? Because mm, we're in the winter time? No, no, no. <laughs> the local sidereal time tells you the hour angle of the spring equinox, right? Let's say this is your local sky, Jenna. You're going to work with me. This is east. This is west, and that's your meridian. Can you? This is the part of the sky that you can't see. Can you tell me where the spring equinox is with an X on this circle? Remember, the local sidereal time is the hour angle of the spring equinox. Yes, so it's 22. So where do I go? You go 22 hours. Yeah, how do I get to 22 hours on the, on the sky? Mm -hmm. How many hours is this on the meridian? Zero. How about here? Six. How about at the nadir? 12. How about over here? 18. 19, 20, 21. I ask you again, Jenna, is the local mm -hmm. sidereal time, uh, sorry, is the spring equinox in our local sky right now? Yes. Right, okay. See how that works now? Mm -hmm. Because it's winter time, 
ironically, the sun is pretty close to the spring equinox. For instance, on March, the sun will have drifted to the spring equinox. Uh, anyways, OK. That's an example of how we do this. It can be a little confusing. We'll try another one today during our homework session. OK, now I got some other stuff to teach you about. I'm erasing. We just learned that there were two types of day. Now I'm going to keep blowing your mind to show you how complex some of this stuff is. I'm now going to tell you that not only are there two types of day, there's also two types of month. Let's take a look at why. There's a difference between the time it takes the moon to go around the Earth in a physics-y kind of sense, its true orbit, and the time it takes between the moon for the moon to go through its set of phases. Class, you learned about the moon in a previous class. What phase is the moon in here? What phase is the moon in, in the circled configuration? Look at your it moon phase. new. Very good, Valentina, new moon. And you, you knew that because the moon is in between Earth and the sun, correct? Yeah. Now, notice that the moon is kind of like down in that direction relative to Earth. As the moon is orbiting Earth, Earth is also orbiting the sun. And one sidereal month later, which is 27.3 days, the moon has come complete full circle to where it started. But what phase, Valentina, since you're so good, what phase is the moon in, in this configuration? The waning crescent, very waning good. crescent. You are very good, waning crescent. And that means the moon hasn't completely gone through a full set of phases because it's not back to new again. The moon has to rotate another two or three days to get back to new moon. So because of the orbit of Earth around the sun, there are two types of month. Let's review what we just learned. I keep putting my markers into my buckets is, and I'm starting to get confused. There are two types of month. There is a sidereal month. You know, uh, guys, maybe we could have a little um, vocabulary breakout box for a second. The word sidereal from Latin, sidereus means star. So a sidereal month is the month with respect to the background stars. The sidereal month is always the true 360 degree orbit of the moon or a planet or a star, because sidereal means with respect to the background stars, as if you were watching from up high in your flying saucer. The sidereal month, which I will call P-SID for period sidereal, for the moon is uh, 27.3 days. But that's different than the time for the moon to complete a set of phases. That is called a synodic month. And while we're on the vocabulary trip, a synod is Latin for a meeting point. Like the moon is in a synod with the sun when it lines up with the sun. Uh, a synod is related to another famous word in the English language, uh, syzygy. This is a cool word because it uses that special rule for vowels, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Syzygy is a word where Y takes on a vowel property, and a syzygy is a three-object synod. So for instance, during an eclipse, you have a syzygy between sun, moon, and earth. That's just Scrabble players like syzygy because you get rid of your Ys for big bonus points, OK? If you don't know Sissy Gee, you're never going to win at Scrabble. Okay, so synodic month. The synodic month 
is the time for the moon to complete a set of phases. In other words, the time to go, for instance, from new moon back to new moon again. And the so-called synodic month uh, for the moon is 29.5 days. Hey, students, let's pretend that you were a pig farmer in ancient Rome and you didn't know nothing about no Copernican solar system. You do, however, know about the moon because you can go out at night and see the moon with your eyeballs. Which month is it easier for you to keep track of, a sidereal month or a synodic month, if you're a pig farmer in ancient Rome? A synodic Sidereal? No, the synodic. Because the way you measure a synodic month is you wait for the moon to go to full, and then you wait 29.5 days later, and it's back to full. If you're a pig farmer in ancient Rome, it's not gonna be so easy to observe the sidereal month. Why? Because you don't have no flying saucer. You can't go above earth and look at the moon and watch it complete a full cycle. It's actually kind of confusing to figure that out from the ground. For this reason, the synodic month is always the observable. I'm gonna bust out some real fancy vocab terms here. An observable in astronomy or physics is a quantity that you can directly observe with your eyeballs and a watch. This is something that you'd actually like to know, but it's not directly observable. It's gonna turn out that there's a formula to convert between sidereal and synodic periods, but I can't give it to you just yet. I need to tell you about another thing. May I erase? Okay. I don't always get to this little tidbit, but for the record, there's also two types of year. Let's make sure I remember them correctly. There's something called a sidereal year and of course, the sidereal year is the true orbit of Earth around the sun. And I believe the sidereal year is 365.25 days. Actually, it's 365.252 something something. There's a whole bunch of digits there. Then there's something called a tropical year. A tropical year is the time to return to the spring equinox. Now, you guys are used to thinking of the spring equinox as a day of the year, but the spring equinox is actually a moment in time. What is that moment in time? It's the moment in time where as Earth is drifting around the sun, the exact moment when the equator of Earth points directly towards you, who, is, who are the sun. During the course of a single day, the equator will not be in perfect alignment until the equator is perfectly pointing towards the sun and the axis is perpendicular. For instance, you guys will notice that if we were to look up the spring equinox in 2021, let's just do that real quick. Let's type in spring equinox 2021. Not only is the spring equinox gonna occur this year on March 20th, but it's gonna be at exactly 5.37 a.m. That will be the moment of the spring equinox, if you will. The tropical year is slightly less than the sidereal year. It's, I believe, 365.24 days. 
it's a delta T, it's a difference of about 20 minutes. And the reason why has to do with the fact that Earth is undergoing gravitational precession from torques that the moon exerts on it. You remember I talked about that as the reason why you're no longer a Pisces if you think you're a Pisces in our last class? Those changing uh, astrological signs have to do with the fact that Earth over 26,000 years, it's tugs on the moon that the moon exerts on Earth cause it to change the orientation of the axis. This causes the time for a year to take place to drift by about 20 minutes because when you're coming back to the moment in time that is the spring equinox, the equator is actually going to lag behind the sun. It's gonna need an extra 20 minutes for the equator to point right back towards the sun or something like that. Guys, I'm starting to have paranoia that I might've messed these two things up. Um, let me look up a tropical year. Did I did I backwards those? Uh, uh, yeah. Shit. I'm sorry, guys. I think I just backwards those the two times. Um. Oh no. Okay. No, I didn't. Sorry. I got a little paranoid for a second. A tropical year is three sixty five point two four days. Uh, and a sidereal year, I just want to make sure I didn't screw that up, is 365. Actually, I guess technically it's 365.26 if you round properly, but I'll, I'll say 365.25. In any case, someone asked me earlier about leap years. Leap years are, the, are caused by the fact that there's not an even number of days per year. Each year, you're drifting by about a quarter of a day per year. So you have to reset the spring equinox to make sure that your calendar stays in sync with the sun. Otherwise, over time, the spring equinox would drift into summertime and fall and winter, and then your calendars would get all upside down relative to the what's happening outside of nature. So we use leap years to kind of fix the fact that there are not exactly 365 days per year. Sometimes people refer to the fact that there's a slight difference between these two as the precession of the equinoxes. That's what they call it. They refer to it as the precession of the equinoxes or something like that. Basically, um, although Egyptians knew that there were roughly 365.25 days in a year, I think it was some Greek astronomers, it was Hipparchos, that actually discovered the precession of the equinoxes by realizing that one of the stars in the sky was drifting over the course of several years. We didn't actually fix this until we invented the Gregorian calendar. The calendar that we use today, the Gregorian calendar, was fixed to peg the spring equinox to March 21st for Christian religious purposes, mostly so that they could glorify some council of Nicaea and compete with other pagan festivals. The history of timekeeping is bound up with politics as much as anything else. Okay. I'm erasing. Lastly, we get to planetary periods. And this is also going to appear in our homeworks today. Just as there were two types of day, just as there were two types of month and two types of year, there are also two types of planetary period. First of all, there is something called the sidereal period. And I'm hoping that by now, you guys have a hunch what the sidereal period of a planet will mean. Take a guess, class. What do you think the sidereal period, given that it has the word sidereal in it, refers to? Who's been following me so far? Um, this is kind of a guess, because it's, it's. I'm trying to figure out whether or not it's referring to the planet in relation to Earth or the planet in relation to the sun. But I In relation to the sun. the sun. 
Okay. Or, mostly in relation to the sun. Okay, so I'm gonna guess that it's the true 360 degree orbit around the sun. Exactly, Ian, that's exactly what I wanna hear. Now I'm gonna use an abbreviation. I'm gonna call the sidereal period of a planet P subscript SID, like SID vicious. But of course, SID stands for sidereal. And the sidereal period means um, just what Ian said. It's the two, true 360 degree orbit of a planet. Um, Ian, it's very interesting that you were worried about whether it was referring to the sun or earth, because the difference is exactly the difference between the two periods. There is then something called the synodic period. I'm going to refer to that as P syn, as in synthesizer for synodic, okay? And the synodic period is the time, I'm gonna to try to put it in a couple of different ways because this is gonna be confusing. It's the time between planetary oppositions, but you guys probably don't know what that means. Another way to think about it is it's the time for a planet to circle the celestial sphere relative to Earth. Let's see if I can take you back in time to some old timey time astronomy and teach you some cool vocab words to help you understand why there would be a difference between a sidereal period and a synodic period. Um, somewhere in one of your handouts, I showed you a picture that looks like this. Um, I just wanna tell you about some old fashioned terms relating to planets. Um, you also hear this kind of stuff when people are spouting their astrology mumbo jumbo. In this diagram, the yellow disc is obviously the sun. This planet in the middle is earth. That's the astrological symbol for earth. And then they have a planet which is interior to Earth, like Venus. And then they have a planet which is exterior to Earth orbit, like Mars. So let's imagine that this is the Sun, Venus, Earth, and Mars. There are key geometrical alignments between the planets and the Sun, which result in observational alignments for the planet on the sky. For instance, when Venus comes between Earth and the Sun, we call it inferior conjunction. When Venus is on the other side of the Sun, we call it superior, oops, sorry, superior conjunction. When Venus is as high in the sky as it can get, either in the morning or the evening, it makes a 90 degree angle with respect to the Sun, and we call that greatest elongation. For outer planets like Mars, they can go through something called quadrature, when they're at a 90 degree angle to the sun. But most importantly, outside planets like Mars and Jupiter can go into something called opposition. And I want you to pay attention that during opposition, the relationship between a planet to Earth is quite similar to the full moon's relationship to Earth. So let me try to clear this diagram up a little bit. Well, now let's just leave it up here. So here's the planet Mars. Here's Earth, and the yellow disk is the sun. When Mars is in opposition, someone who is watching Mars in the sky at night will know that Mars is in opposition. Can you tell me what time Mars will cross your meridian when it's in opposition? Then you do not know your faces of the moon as well as you might have thought. Opposition relates to which phase of the moon, if you had to pick one. Maybe Valentina knows because she's so good at phases of the moon. I will say new maybe or? Uh, I thought new is when the moon was in between Earth and the sun. True. I don't know. I, I was going to say, is it like a, a full? Yeah, how did you know it was full, Ian? Because 
uh, the Earth is between it and the Sun, so it's on the right side. In, in opposition, Mars has the same relationship to Earth that the full moon does. So, Ian, could you guess what time Mars will cross your meridian? Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, what it? What time is it for an observer located at the Blue Arrow? That's. Is that midnight? Yeah, because you're pointing okay. away from the sun, right? Yeah. Okay. Sun is at your nadir, or your nadir meridian, technically. Yeah. In other words, when Mars is in opposition, it will cross my meridian at midnight, right, Ian? What time will Mars rise when it's in opposition? Let's see, meridian here and horizon should be here. Uh, I'm not really sure, but Can anyone six noon six. Who said who said something? I'm probably wrong, but I think it's six. Yeah, six is ambiguous. There are two sixes each day. Six a.m. False. Okay. Is it six p.m.? That's right, because Earth spins okay. counterclockwise, right? it's spinning like this. So when your head is pointed in the direction of the red arrow, Mars is coming up over your eastern horizon and the sun sets along the western horizon, right? Remember, we did this for the full moon. The full moon rises at, shit, let me get a straight arrow here. The full moon rises at 6 p.m., crosses your meridian at midnight and sets at 6 a.m. That's how an observer would know when Mars is in opposition. It would be up all night, crossing your meridian at midnight. Can you think of any other observational thing that would happen to Mars at opposition? How else might Mars look different during opposition? This might be too hard for you guys. It'll look closer? Well, you don't see closeness, you see brightness. Mars at opposition will be really, really bright in the sky because it's way closer to Earth than it is during quadrature or God forbid conjunction or something. So if you're an ancient pig farmer, if you're a pig farmer in ancient Rome and you're ancient, okay, let's say you're in ancient Rome and you're just a fella hop skipping his way along the field and you look up at Mars and you say, remember Mars is your God. So you're kind of like, it's the God of war. So you might be kind of jittery about that. And you look up and say, holy shit, Mars is really, really bright tonight and it's crossing overhead right at midnight. This must be Mars's day. This must be opposition, okay? Mars is opposite the sun and therefore I should do battle with my enemies or something, right? Okay, that's what a synodic period is. It's the time between oppositions and it's not the same as the true period of Mars. I can demonstrate that with this diagram uh somewhere shoot hold on okay let's say mars is in opposition one day and you're ready to smite your enemies mars is high in your sky at midnight then mars continues on its way around the sun and earth continues on its way around the sun except earth has the inside track so it's moving a lot faster than mars one sidereal year later Earth has made it all the way around the sun, but look at Mars. Mars is only about halfway around the sun. Then Earth starts to catch up to Mars again, and boom, a year and a half later or something, you're back in opposition. Now, if you're a Roman centurion, you don't know no, nothing about no planets going around no sun, all you know is when you look up in the sky, Mars is back up at midnight and it's time to smite your enemies again. In other words, Mars has completed a synodic orbit, but has it completed a sidereal orbit? No, because it hasn't made it all the way around the sun. In other words, we observe synodic periods, but from a physics point of view, we'd actually like to know the sidereal period of a planet, its true orbit around the sun. Luckily for you, my fellow astronomers, there's a formula that lets us do it. 
But the formula is different depending on whether the planet is an inside planet or an outside planet. So I kind of have to teach you two formulas. May I erase this? Okay. So let's say you are an inner planet and the inner planets include Mercury and Venus then you can calculate the sidereal period, P sid, by taking the synodic period and dividing it by the synodic period plus one year. And you need to put that in parentheses for the order of operations. Let's say that you are an outer planet. Outer planets include Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond. For an outer planet, the formula is almost the same, except there's a minus sign. So the sidereal period is the synodic period divided by the synodic period minus one year. Let's make a note to self. All periods need to be in units of years for this formula to work. We better try this out. Let's see if you can do it without my help. Mars has a synodic period of 2.14 years. Find the sidereal period of Mars. Anyone think they can do that one without my help? Yeah. All right. Let's see your let's see your moves. Um, my calculator is kind of dim right now, so I can't really show you, but I can just read it. Uh, yeah, so read it out to me. Okay. Um, Round got... tastefully, please. Okay. <laughs> um, I got 0. 0.68. Wrong. Okay. <laughs> did you use parentheses? No, you didn't. That's why you got it wrong. Oh, I think I used, I used the wrong formula. That's why I did the oh, plus. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. M well, Mars is an outer planet, right? That was the first test. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I thought outer and then just looked at the other That's one. That's okay. No big deal. <laughs> try it again. Or we could try it together as a class. So we have the second formula. So we will have the sidereal period. Would it, would it be 1.88? That's right. Okay. So we have 2.4 years over 2.14 years minus one. And I got 1.88 years. Let me show you how I punched that in, in case your calculator challenged. 2.14. Divided by open parentheses, 2.14 minus one, close parentheses, then equals 1.88 years. Make sure you can do that. And with that, we have used up all of our time for today. So, well, we're close to it anyways. Uh, there's going to be a lost at sea problem in our homework. I was going to run you through an example if there was time, but I think you'll just learn how to do it during your homework session. 
What do you say since we have a long homework today? We start with our tea break now. Um, my laptop says 123. My cell phone says 127. So we'll come back when my cell phone says 145. Does that sound like a plan? That should give me enough time to goof off and drink some tea. Um, so 145, 15 minutes or so from now, we'll, we'll get started on homework number two, which is going to be wild, OK? OK. I might have to do that recording like normal. Uh, or with the old recording or the new one or whatever? Yes. Yep. Um, um, I had one question real quick. Yep. Um, I did the homework with the last recording, and you didn't do the full problem for, I think it was like 40, what, it was like the second to last question. Huh. Uh, for this, I already did it, so if you want me to like email you my PDF of it or whatever, I can. Yeah, why don't you do that? Yeah, because I think last time it was taking a wicked long time, right? Yeah, like you did like I think the first two or the first three or something like that. Whenever these little discrepancies happen, Aaron, it would obviously be way cooler if we could all be in sync on what happens this year. But I, I yeah. might, as long as, you know, I think that problem had like three parts and I did A and B, but I skipped C in the interest of time. So, okay. so that's okay. I won't penalize you for that, but I'm glad you reminded me because I might have forgotten. Um, okay. Uh, so if you're all set, if you want to email it to me, I can tell you how it looks, okay? Okay. All right, the rest of you guys sit tight um, uh, and I'll be back in a minute or in 15 minutes. Okay, peoples, I'm ready to get back to work. If you are, get ourselves started on homework number two. Who's out there in the studio audience? We got Kim, we got anyone else? I, I sent a message, but I'm probably gonna have my camera off for a little bit because I'm also eating something while we do this. Okay. Well, what, is, what are you eating? Is it a good, tasty? <laughs> Chicken nuggets. <laughs> okay, sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't the rest of you chicken nuggets join me? Okay. <clears throat> um, could you guys look up the, the assignment numbers? Because I think it's from chapter S1, right? So obviously at the top, have your name. Good idea to put astronomy 1010 in your section, whatever it is. And then of course, this is homework number two. Five problems from special chapter S1 in the book, which is after chapter three. What are the numbers, guys? Or do I have to look them up? Um, yes, I have them. Okay. It's 38, 41, 47, 51, and 53 ABC. Okay. Um, Jenna, why don't you go ahead and um, read us uh, chapter, well, I'll write it like this, S1 number 38. Okay. Opposite rotation. Suppose Earth rotated in a direction opposite to its orbital direction. That is, suppose it rotated clockwise, as seen from above the North Pole, but orbited counterclockwise. Um, would the solar day still be longer than the sidereal day? Explain. Would the solar day still be longer than the sidereal day? <clears throat> Okay, so what's the answer? Perhaps we should draw a diagram to see what's going on. That can help us think when we're feeling confused. On the left-hand side of the paper, let's put the sun. On the right-hand side of the paper, leave yourself some headroom. We'll place the Earth. <clears throat> and we'll start with a local observer at 12 p.m. or noon. 
Now the orbit of the planet is still going counterclockwise, so we'll draw a few more Earths. We'll draw one, two, three, four, five more Earths. And um, here, maybe I should make the arrow. <coughs> Well, I guess I'll keep it blue. I was gonna make it a different color so that it would pop, but I think blue might be the best. Now, let's see. If the Earth is orbiting clockwise, that means the arrow is gonna be kind of spinning in a direction like so, right? In a, in a that kind of direction. So if you're pointing to the left at noon, sometime later, your arrow ought to be pointing down. And then a short time after that, your arrow should be pointing sort of to the right. And then your arrow should be pointing up. And then your arrow should be pointing back to the left. And if you rotate a little more, the arrow will point back towards the sun. What does this tell us about the solar day and the sidereal day class? Can you identify where the solar day is and where the sidereal day is? <clears throat> I'm gonna try to take a, a like, are you asking like which um, error? Like it will be the solar day, like until which error? Yeah, which error? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, Valentina. So I would say the solar day will be until like the four one because like you did the whole rotation around the sun and the sidereal will be the fifth one. Hold on, let's read the definitions out again. Um, Valentina, what was the definition of the sidereal day that you have in your notebooks? Uh, it says 23 hour, 56 minutes and it's the true 360 degrees has been of earth. Good. So which one of these numbers seems to represent the true 360 degree spin of earth, Valentina? Four. That's four. right. And that would make four. So do you see how that's changed your answer a bit? Yeah. Okay. So tell me what the real answer is. So I did a like, I switch her around, right? Yeah. So help me figure that out now. What does four? So the side, the four, it will be the sidereal uh, day, <laughs> and the five, it will be the solar day. Right, because you can see in part five, Valentina, you're pointing back towards the sun, right? Yeah. Now let's think about that question. Is the solar day still longer than the sidereal day? Yes or no? Yeah. Wait a minute, guys. I fudged up, didn't I? I screwed something up. What did I screw up? I did something wrong. I, I, I can't believe I did this, but I actually screwed up. What did I do? Were we supposed to rotate um, clockwise? Yeah, Jenna. Look, I, I knew I was supposed to rotate clockwise, but I actually rotate counterclockwise, didn't I? Yeah. Fuck. Okay, so let's try that again. Sorry, Valentina. That's how it normally works. Okay, this time we're gonna start off at 12 p.m. But this time we're gonna do it right and we're gonna spin clockwise. So for the first Earth, I'll point up. For the second Earth, I'll point to the right. For the third Earth, I'll point down because I'm now spinning in this direction. For the fourth Earth, I'll point towards the sun. And for the fifth Earth, I'll point back to the left. Valentina, which number represents the solar day and which number represents the sidereal day? The solar day will be four. Uh huh. And the sidereal day will be five. Okay.
So in a weird way, you were right the first time, but for all the wrong reasons. Okay. <laughs> all right, so what's the final answer to our question then? Normally the solar day is 24 hours and normally the sidereal day is 2356. Will the solar day still be longer than the sidereal day? No, because either way we start at 12 p.m. and the side, sorry, sidereal day um, would be after the solar day. I want to clean that up a little bit. You're kind of right. The solar, the sidereal day would definitely be after the solar day, but which which day will actually change? Like, will the solar day still be 24 hours? Will the sidereal day still be 23 hours and 56 minutes? Which day is going to uh, change? The sidereal day would be longer. The solar day would stay 24 hours. I disagree. No. My take on it is that the spin, the, the rate that Earth is spinning will not change. Do you see my point? Whoever is in the troll background there? Yeah, that was me. Um, so the sidereal is the rate it's spinning, correct? Right. Well, it, it's the true spin, and we're assuming that the, the rate is staying the same. Okay. In other words, it should take the same amount of time to complete a full 360 degree spin, which yeah. is how long? Uh, 24 hours. Oh, oh no, 20, 23, um, 56. So my friend in the, in the darkness there, what do you think the new solar daytime would be then? It would be shorter than 2356. By how many minutes? Um... I forget. Is it 15? No, just look right here. How many minutes shorter than a solar than 24 hours is this? Oh, four. So what will the new solar day be? Um, would it be it'd be four less than the sidereal? Correct. So then it'd be 2352. Good. <laughs> well, in fact, it's not quite ideal for us to say the sidereal day will now be longer because the sidereal day hasn't changed. It might be better for us to word it as the solar day will now be four minutes shorter. Do you see the, the nitpick there? Say yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. All right, so let's write something down together. Include the diagram in your answer and then include the following text. Um, I think we're going to erase a little bit of this just to kind of get it all down. If the Earth spins clockwise while continuing uh, to orbit, counterclockwise that no the solar day will no longer ah let's write it in a different way the solar day will not be longer than a sidereal day, full stop. In fact, it will be four minutes shorter at 23 hours and 52 minutes. Okay, now for the description of why. Anyone think they can explain why? <clears throat> I know our diagram kind of does it. We could say by inspection. But um, what's happening in the diagram? Doesn't it have why? something to do with the meridian? Yes. The meridian is absolutely the key to all this. The arrow represents the meridian. So what do we say then? Can I cheat and read off the homework? 
because uh, a local a local observer's meridian points back to the sun for completing a full 360. Right. In other words, we're keeping track of the rotation of the meridian. The meridian points to the sun before it spins a full 360. Let's just write that again. A local observer's <coughs> meridian will point back to the sun <coughs> that's sun, excuse me, before completing a 360 degree rotation. Oops. Um, actually, while there's a little pause here, I did want to ask, because I didn't hear you, uh, what was going on earlier, because my mic tends to cut out. Uh, yep. Did you want me to stay for this to get that last little bit for uh, part C or? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, no, since you've already, the way I look at it, Aaron, is you've already put in your two hours working on these problems. And even though everyone else probably will do that little part C and you haven't, that's such a small percentage of the overall homework that I can let it slide. I don't think okay. it's worth you having to spend another two hours just to get part C. So, okay. And, and in fact, if, if this starts to drag, I may let the others off the hook on part C as well. Okay, because I just didn't know if I was gonna be able to stay for the full meeting for the homework. That's why I did it early. Yeah, um, I mean- I definitely I wanted to come well, in and ask. Sure, if you've already watched the video from last semester and you've put your two hours in, then that's, that's all I can ask of you, okay? So okay. I didn't get to look at your email if you sent it, but I'll presume that you did everything I did last time and you did it right, so we'll see. Okay. Okay? Um, right. so, so if you want to bounce, that's fine. All right. Thank you. Sure, Have bye -bye. a great day. You too. Okay. Everyone else? I need to erase this to move on. So I'm good. Jim? Can you just leave it for one more minute, please? Yes. Um, you know, I'm going to go through this whole thing today, but in the future, I'd like to get more, more people interacting with me. It's good that I got Valentina, Kim, Jenna, and whoever's in the background there. Um, and I know Ryan doesn't have a camera, so I guess that's technically fine. I don't want to drop too much lower than this, otherwise it starts to get silly what, the, what I'm doing, you know? <clears throat> Almost set now. Thank you. I was just eating. That's okay. Here I go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Valentina, how do you feel about reading us S141? Okay. Fundamentals of your local sky. Answer each of the following for your latitude. Where is the north? Uh, if I may interrupt you, very nice, but uh, let's write down our latitude. What is it? Remember the Rhode Island latitude? 41, 42. 42 degrees. Are we north or south of the equator? North. Very good. Okay, what's part A ask? Where is the north or south celestial pole in your sky? Okay. Remember that when we describe a position on the sky, I want you guys to be using the horizon system. We learned about this last time. Uh, what angles does the horizon system use? <clears throat> does anyone know what the answer is? Um, altitude of 42 degrees north and azimuth of zero degrees or due north. Yeah, there's no north for altitude. Um, north <laughs> or zero degrees. Good. Okay, Valentina. Uh, anyways, the horizon system uses altitude and azimuth. It's basically the north celestial pole is close to Polaris. Um, uh, Valentina, what's B? 
Describe the meridian in your sky, specifying at least three distinct points along it, such as the points at which it meets your horizon and its highest point. Okay, so the meridian is an arc. We need more than just one altitude and azimuth. Um, they want three distinct points. And the way that I format this when I answered uh, a problem the other day is I considered where does it rise, how high does it reach, and where does it set? What I call the rise, the reach, and the set. And each of these points will have its own altitude and azimuth. Earlier today, I had to get you guys to remember what the meridian is. Why don't we grab a piece of our local sky here? Oh, come on. There's that picture. Got a nice little picture of the local sky popping around here somewhere. Here we go. Okay. And uh, 46. So the meridian, if you all remember, starts here in the north, comes up to your zenith, and it sets back down south. So I would say if we were going to do a rise, a reach, and a set, this could be the rising point, that would be the reaching point, and that would be the setting point. So why doesn't someone start us off and give me the altitude and the azimuth of that dot? <clears throat> um, the altitude would be zero, right? Excellent, because it's on your horizon. What about the azimuth? That would be Well, actually, I'm, I'm. Azimuth is degrees measured clockwise of north. Yeah, that's what I was think. I was about to say that is due north, right? Yeah. So that would also be zero. Yep. Okay. So in other words, zero degrees, zero degrees or north, and yes. The way to put that is due north. All right. Altitude and azimuth of this point. That would be 90 degrees azimuth, and I'm not sure about the altitude off the top of my head. Wait, right? it's 90 degrees altitude. Altitude is, oh, your yeah. degrees, is your degrees above the horizon. It's 90 degrees Sorry. from the horizon. Right, right, right. Okay, now I have this written down. So the zenith is 90 degrees altitude, and it's undefined for the azimuth. Right, because it's equidistant from all the different it's... points. So it... It doesn't have a well-defined uh, azimuth. So mm -hmm. what we'll do is we'll write down 90 degrees. We'll put a couple of dashes in for azimuth since that doesn't make sense. But we could have, we wanted to remember that it's at the zenith. How about the set point? Set point is, uh, you know, here. Uh, would it be zero degrees altitude? Yep. And how about the azimuth? And how many degrees from north are you? Uh, I forget what the photo looks like. Sorry. Okay. So azimuth is like this. Okay. Um, 180? Yeah. Or mm -hmm. we could put south, either one. Okay. And 
And that's also known as due south. <clears throat> All right, I'm erasing here. Shout at me if you have an issue with that. Valentina, part C. Describe the celestial equator in your sky, specifying at least three distinct points along it. Okay. Once again, we're going to play that rise, reach, and set game. Three points, rise, reach, and set. Each point on the sky requires two coordinates, an altitude and an azimuth. If we want some diagram help, never a bad idea. We can see our rise, reach, and set points here. This is the rise, this is the reach, and over here is the set. Let's start with the, uh, the rise. Who's got that? <clears throat> Come on, people, work with me. I already know the answers. That's why I have my degree in astronomy. That's why I have a job. You guys have to work for this a little bit, okay? <laughs> Try it. We got someone in the chat box here. Altitude zero degrees, azimuth 90 or east. Ryan, I like your moves. I like your moves. Zero degrees altitude and, oops, sorry, 90 or east azimuth. Also known as due east. Okay. Well, Ryan got one of them. Who knows about this point up here? Altitude and azimuth of the highest point on the celestial equator. You might want to look at your alpha, beta, gamma, delta game. Forty-eight degrees. Is that altitude or azimuth? Sorry, um, uh, altitude of forty-eight degrees. Excellent. How about the azimuth? And the azimuth is 180 degrees. Or south. Or south. Okay. And just to speed things up a little bit, can you quickly also, uh, Jenna, give me that point too? The set point? Yeah, and the set point is zero degrees or 200. I'm sorry, zero degrees altitude, 270 degrees or west. Nice. also known as due west. <clears throat> Gonna erase. Um, Valentina, part B. Does the sun ever appear at your it? If so, when? If not, why not? Okay. To answer this question, we might want to take a moment to look at one of our diagrams. Um, <clears throat> let's see if we can find the path of the sun throughout the year. 
I showed you a picture showing you the path of the sun here. But this picture, although it's like a bit sophisticated in terms of its graphic design, slide 21, um, I don't like it because north is kind of tilted forward a bit. This picture is more crude, but I kind of like it because it shows you the path of the sun on those three different days. But now the south to north line is kind of in the same direction. So <clears throat> what does it look like? If this is the path of the sun on the winter solstice, this is the spring equinox, and that's the summer solstice. Does the sun ever seem, well, actually, I guess we don't know if this is designed for Rhode Island or not. What did we decide was the altitude of the celestial equator in our last problem? We said it was zero on the last one, right? What? No. 40, 48 degrees. 48 degrees was the maximum altitude of the celestial equator. Oh, I did, for some reason I blanked out on the word maximum. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. How many degrees above the celestial equator can the sun get during the summer solstice? You might think of it as the maximum declination of the sun. How many degrees above the celestial equator will the sun go? Not sure? Oh. This is a guess, but is it 90 degrees? No, 90 degrees would put it like way the doink over here. Okay. This is a much smaller angle than 90 degrees. Hmm. What is this angle? How would I know what that angle is? Geez, if only I knew the maximum declination of the sun. I mean, do you still want us to say it or? Hell yeah, I do. 23.5 degrees. Okay. But so guess... then that means the maximum altitude the sun can reach in the Rhode Island local sky must be Hmm. 71.5 degrees. Very good. Okay. So will the sun ever reach the zenith in the Rhode Island local sky? No. 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 The sun will never reach the zenith in the Rhode Island sky but only a max altitude of 48 degrees plus 23.5 degrees equals 71.5 degrees in the south, here I'm going to I'm going to put together three prepositional phrases. In the south, at noon, on the summer solstice. Is that yeah, prepositional phrases, right? <clears throat> In the South is what I should have said for English as a second language students. That's what these are called, right? Prepositional phrases. I think it's considered stylistically unelegant. Does anyone know their English? Like in the game Clue, Mr. Mustard in the library with the candlestick, okay? 
<laughs> okay, I'm going to erase now. Valentina, part E. What range of declinations make a star circumpolar in your sky? Okay. This can be pretty difficult to answer. First of all, what do they mean by range? What does a range mean in mathematics? It's the distance between the lowest and highest number of a set. In other words, we're going to need two answers here. We're going to need a lower, a minimum declination. And then I sometimes use delta or delta or dec for de declination. The declination should be between two numbers, a minimum and a maximum. So that's what our answer should look like. Uh, what the hell are circumpolar stars? Does anyone remember what a circumpolar star is? Let's find some pictures of circumpolar stars. Anyone remember about those? Those are the stars that like rotate around the North Star, right? Sort of. All stars kind of rotate around the North Star. What makes circumpolar stars different? I'm not sure. <laughs> For instance, Ian, all of the stars in this picture rotate around the North Celestial Pole, correct? But Ian, not all of these stars are circumpolar. Are these circumpolar ones the ones that we don't see the complete rotation of? It's kind of the opposite. Oh, OK. <laughs> so this is circumpolar because we could see the complete rotation if we wait. Oh, I got you. Circumpolar stars never rise or set. The blue arrow points towards a circumpolar star. The red arrow points towards a non-circumpolar star because that one's setting behind the rock there. OK. Thank you. Now, sure, the next thing is for us to remember what declination means. Let's look at a picture of some rotating stars in our sky. Where's that diagram that I like? What does? What does declination mean? Isn't that um, the amount that it will rise and set in the sky over like a, a year or a period of time? Nope. Maybe, Ian, we should regurgitate from our notebook. OK. <laughs> it's declination is the degrees positive or negative from celestial, <laughs> celestial <laughs> equator. Good. So Jenna, the red arrow currently points to the red ring. What would the declination of the red ring be? Um, the declination. Declination. Um, positive 90 degrees? Nope. The red ring is the celestial equator. What is the declination of the celestial equator? OK, I'm going to choose a slightly different diagram for this here. I think I want 46 or something. What is the declination of the celestial equator? Zero degrees. Good. Uh, shoot, this is messy. Let's try a text tool. Actually, oh. This is a good strategy for those of you who do typing stuff. What I'm going to do first, uh, don't you give up me, Mr. Computer. Uh, come on, give me the task bar. There you go. I'm going to grab a degree symbol. Uh, Copy. All right. 
the declination 49. The declination of the celestial equator, control paste, is zero degrees. <laughs> okay, what's the declination of, well, Polaris is up here, right? That's where Polaris is. What's the declination of the North Celestial Pole? That one's not positive 90 degrees. Very good. I like your posi moves. So this is positive 90 control paste. <laughs> okay. Now, is Polaris a circumpolar star? No, because it is what it's. Uh... The definition, Ian, of circumpolar is never rise or set. Oh, okay. Then yeah, it is. It is. It's the ultimate circumpolar star. Yeah. So that must be the maximum declination, right? Because you can't have any star with a greater declination than positive 90. The question is, what is the lowest circumpolar star? Lowest declination. For instance, in this picture, stars that are circumpolar, they'll be orbiting around Polaris, and they'll all be circumpolar. But at some point, we have to figure out what is the last circumpolar star? Um, would it be on the celestial equator or would it be just above it? No, the celestial equator clearly sets and rises, right? Or rises and sets. Yeah. Let's look at that diagram again of circumpolar stars from my lecture. Where are they? Where are you, circumpolar stars? I guess the last circumpolar star would be like, I don't know, like, well, this has a mountain, but like that one, right? What makes the last circumpolar star the last circumpolar star? It would have been better if I had a flat horizon here to work with. It doesn't set. Yeah, but neither do any of these. What's different about the, the very last circumpolar star? It just touches the horizon. The horizon in which direction? Which direction is this? The northern horizon. Aha, very interesting. So according to our friend in the background there, the last circumpolar star. Oh, I got that right. You did. The last Ooh. circumpolar star will be that star which just grazes the northern horizon. In other words, if I only knew the declination of my northern horizon, I would know the declination of the lowest circumpolar star. Now, that's probably going to be too tricky for you guys at first. You guys decided that this declination was zero degrees, and this declination up here was positive 90 degrees. Let's, try, let's start you off easier. What's the declination of your zenith? You should know that. 42.3. 42 degrees, positive 42 degrees. I don't know about that 0.3 jazz, but whatever. <laughs> I like points. Yeah, I like points too. All right, now, remembering, if you will, that the celestial equator also extends like down here, what do you think the declination of your northern horizon is? The same as, as the zenith? Nope. Negative. Nope, because remember, this angle here is your latitude, but this angle here is also your latitude. So this angle here cannot be your latitude. That'd be 132 since it's 90. There is no such thing as a declination of 132. Declinations run from negative 90 at the south celestial pole all the way to positive 90 at the north celestial pole. 40, 48 degrees. Uh, 48. Right. This angle, 48 degrees above the celestial equator, because this angle is 42 degrees. Trixie, how that works. So positive 48 
positive 90 are the range of circumpolar declinations. Valentina will now read us part F, which is what I call anti-circumpolar stars. What if the range of declinations for stars that you can never see in your sky? I refer to these as anti-circumpolar. I don't know if everybody else does. And our declinations, once again, will be from some minimum to some maximum number. First of all, <clears throat> let's explain why there are anti-circumpolar stars by looking at that diagram of the rotating sky again. This one won't be helpful here, but where's that diagram? The yellow ring would represent anti-circumpolar stars. They're stars that, no matter how the Earth spins, they won't come above your horizon for some latitude because they're like, let's take Rhode Island, for example. There are stars in the southern hemisphere of the globe that I can never see because I've spent most of my life in Rhode Island. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to go to Argentina so we could see the large and small Magellanic clouds with our naked eye? That would be magical indeed. The anti-circumpolar stars should probably start at the south celestial pole. We're not going to see them from Rhode Island. And they'll go up to those stars which just barely graze your southern horizon. So I guess we need to know what's the declination of the south celestial pole and what's the declination of your southern horizon? Who can answer that question? Remember that declination is relative to the celestial equator, not your horizon, but the celestial equator. The south celestial pole should be the easy one. 90. We use it's positive. Zero. It's negative 90 because it's negative below, 90. The, below the celestial equator. Fine. So what is the angle between the south celestial pole and this southern horizon? It should be 90 minus that angle, whatever that angle is. Well, negative 48. That's right. It's 48 degrees below the celestial equator. So our answer is anti-circumpolar stars go from negative 90 to negative 48 degrees. Pardon my handwriting. And for this reason, Uh, if I look up the Large Magellanic Cloud, the Large Magellanic Cloud is a little mini galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. And if you're in the southern hemisphere of uh, Earth, <clears throat> you can actually see it on your naked sky. Notice it has a declination of minus 70 degrees, roughly. So that's why you can't see it. But if you could go to Argentina or something, Here's um, the Parnell Observatory in the Atkama Desert in Peru, I think. Uh, get you guys out of the Look, that's what it looked like. You're sitting here at the telescopes, and you can actually see these two dwarf galaxies sitting overhead with the naked eye. Isn't that cool? We can't see those from Rhode Island because they're anti-circumpolar for us. Got to go south. This isn't a fancy camera or anything? That wasn't a fancy camera at all. All it was was a long exposure photograph. Wow. It looks fancy because you can see so many stars, but it's just a long exposure photograph, so they collect more light. Uh, okay. It was probably also on, because Earth is spinning, they probably had a, a sidereal mount that could track the sky. Otherwise, you would get kind of star drift, and you would see those tracks, like in the circumpolar. So it probably was fancy enough to have a little fancy mount, but... Besides that, it was probably just a good old fashioned DSLR camera, like the kind used for wedding photography or something. I mean, that's a little fancy, but not too fancy. Okay, such is 41 and we can move on. Um, I just wanted to figure this out. So were we talking about declination and stuff on Monday? Okay, because I end up having to do the labs after Wednesday. So I was like, why do I not know any of this? That's okay, why. Yeah, so unfortunately, I know when people are watching the videos later, it must be very tempting for them to like 
be tired after work and to fast forward to the lecture and just go right to the labs and homeworks. Not saying that's what you did, Ian, but some people definitely do this. The problem is that if you miss those definitions, things can get wicked confusing. So yeah, well, I just haven't watched it at all yet. Okay, yeah, so just make sure you go back in time and slog your way through that, okay? Okay. Um, declination is just degrees plus or minus from the celestial equator. Sick. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, who's available for me? Yudi, you're next on my Hollywood squares. Are you down to read S1 number 47? Just give me one second to pull it up. Sure thing. <laughs> I think I'm allergic to homework. Bless you. Thanks. Wait, I'm sorry. I just joined the Zoom. Are we on lab three? We're doing homework number two. Oh, homework. Okay, does anyone, okay. Ian, do you have the questions? Yeah, Let's give you a break. Yeah, I think I have it open. All right. Um, S147. 47. Okay. Uh, lost at sea. Um, during a vacation, you decide to take a solo boat trip. While contemplating the universe, you lose track of your location. Fortunately, you have some astronomical tables and instruments, as well as a UT clock. You thereby put together the following description of your situation. It is the March equinox. The sun is on your meridian at altitude 75 degrees in the south. The UT clock reads 22. Uh, and then... A is what is your latitude? How do you know? Uh, the sun is at your meridian. Did you say 75 degrees in the south? Yes. And the universal clock, uh, remind me again what it said? Uh, 22 hours. Okay. Um, you're going to have to do a lost at sea problem like this in your uh, exam, too. And I didn't get to practice how to do this, but basically all the stuff that you've learned up to now can be put together to do some sea navigation. To help our brains out, why don't we make a little diagram of this by drawing a sort of 2D local sky that runs north to south. So I'll make a little cute one here. Okay, so there's our sky. We'll do north on the right, south on the left. We'll put some waves in here. And then let's put a little sailboat and we'll have the mast of the sailboat point up towards our zenith. Now, they've told us that the sun is on the meridian, 75 degrees in the south. So class, can someone direct my magic marker? Where should I put the sun on this diagram? Tell me where to go. To the left of the zenith, about 75 degrees. Or 75 from the south, 15 degrees left of the zenith, right? Do you agree with that? Yep. Sorry, are you talking to me? You talking to me, huh? I don't think so. All right. Um, there's a part A and B, right? Yeah, there, I think there's a part C as well. Let's do part A. Find our latitude. 
How would I find my latitude here, guys? Anyone have any brilliant ideas? Does it? How... Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't think I know something <laughs> that I need to know. Um, what's the rule that I taught you guys about finding your latitude when we do celestial navigation? You learned a special rule. You put a box around it, and you found some stars next to it. Is it? Um, it's the same as our a meridian. No, that doesn't like. Make sense. The meridian is a north to south line that can't be a latitude, right? It's something else, Jenny. You might want to look it up in your book, in your notes. The altitude of Polaris. If only we knew where to put Polaris on here. They told us where the sun is, but they didn't tell us where Polaris was. What's the significance of the spring equinox? Why did they have to tell us it was oh. the spring equinox? Our latitude is the beta alpha, is the beta angle. So it'd be 90 minus 75 degrees is our latitude. Be Jenna, you're right, but you're only right because the sun is on the spring equinox. The trick here, Jenna, was to recognize the following thing. Let's look at the path of the sun. Uh, uh, let's look at the path of the sun here on picture 21 or 22. Let's do it on 22 actually, the next slide. On the spring equinox, the sun is actually traveling on the celestial equator because on that day, the, on the spring equinox, the sun is on the spring equinox, if that makes any sense. And uh, on the spring equinox, the sun is here and that means it's also on the celestial equator. And what that means is that on the spring equinox, the sun is traveling through the sky on the path of the celestial equator, shown here. It will rise due east, cross your meridian at 48 degrees, and set due west. That's for Rhode Island anyways. So yes, in that case, Jenna, this angle, which we call beta in our little game, that angle is your latitude, right? In other words, the trick is to realize that this is not only the sun, but this is the celestial equator. Okay, so what's the answer then? Jenna says it's 90 minus 75 degrees, which is what? 15. Degrees but that's only half of a latitude. Latitudes require not only an angle, but they also require a direction. Are we 15 degrees north or are we 15 degrees south? South. How do you know? Um, because, um, because of the celestial equator. The celestial equator is in what part of the sky? The southern part. The southern part. But normally, for a northern hemisphere observer, where would the celestial equator be? South. Uh, OK, but that doesn't make any sense. So someone's wrong, and I think it's Jenna. The celestial equator travel. Hey, Jenna, do you have any plants back there? It looks like I see some plants. Are those yeah. real plants? Do yep. you put your plants in the southern window or the northern window? What do you I guess those plants don't look like they're near any window. I don't know. I killed my plants this year. Oops. Um, but I'll tell you where I put my plants or where I did when I kept them alive. I put them in the southern window over there. That's sort of south. There's a lot of buildings downtown, so it's hard. 
It's like Stonehenge. You don't get a lot of sunlight. Um, <clears throat> I put my plants in the southern window because the sun travels to the southern part of the sky because I'm in the bloody northern hemisphere. So Jenna, you had it all backwards. The fact that we see the celestial equator in the south means that you're actually in the northern hemisphere. In other words, sun is in the south, you are in the north. If the sun was in the northern sky, then you'd be in the southern hemisphere, okay? So this is 15 degrees north. Part B, what's it want us to do from part B? Let me get it right now. Uh, B says, what is longitude? How do you know? Okay. How do we define longitude? Oops, somebody loves me. Sorry, guys. How do we do that longitude? Um, longitude is degrees east or west of the prime meridian, right? Yeah, so if only I knew how many degrees east or west of the prime meridian this boat was. We do know that, what's the value of this universal time clock? What's that telling me? Universal time, so that's telling us the hour angle, or no, that's the wrong thing I'm looking at. That's telling us how far from the prime meridian we are. If well, it's kind of. This tells you the mean solar time at the prime meridian. They're telling oh. you it's 10 p.m. on the prime meridian. But what time is it in our picture here, in our location? Here's a hint, it's not nighttime. The sun is up, <laughs> yeah. right? What time oh, do you think it would be? noon, right? Because that's when the sun's at the meridian. Right. So that means we must be how many hours off from the prime meridian, Ian? Um, 10. Okay. And how many degrees would that correspond to? How many degrees per hour is it? Uh, 15. Oh, my dimensional analysis is bad. Sorry. Hours have to go on the bottom, right? Hours on bottom, degrees on top. So that means we're at what longitude? Hundred degrees longitude. Okay, but that's only half of a longitude. We need to know if it's east or west. That part can get confusing. Are we, is Rhode Island east or west of, of England? West. Yeah. But like, okay, I just use, you know how I said that I like to listen to the BBC? I always know that it's like later in, in, in Bush House London than it is in Rhode Island. Like if we go to world clock time zones, Right now, uh, I'm gonna keep track of the time here. In, in Eastern Standard Time, it's 2.50, but in London, it's almost 7.50 p.m. So London is like five hours ahead, right? So the, the, the trick that I used, which is just experiential knowledge, if the local time is earlier than England, you're west. If the local time is later, then you're east. So what's so this? We, it would be 150 degrees west. Right. That's how I did it. Okay, so we got our latitude 15 degrees north. We got our longitude 150 degrees west. What's part C ask? Sorry, let me pull it up again. Uh, C says, consult a map based on your position. What is the nearest, where is the nearest land? Which way should you sail to reach it? Um, so I've got a globe here, but let's see if we can do the old uh, Google Maps thing. Well, would we be in the Pacific since yep. we're only five hours uh, behind England? And if we're another five hours behind that, since it's 10 hours, we would be west of California. Mm -hmm. I think we can just do 15 degrees north, 150 degrees west. 
So we're out here in the ocean. Let's find the nearest land. Huh. Looks like we got to sail north and west to Hawaii. Cool. We are really lost at sea. Okay. So sail northwest to Hawaii. And that takes care of problem number 47. Hey, Kim, what's that pooch's name again? I remember that dog had a cool name. Lunatic. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is what goes on in the mind of a lunatic. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's my dog. She has a she has a crescent-shaped moon on her back. No kidding. That's the yeah. official dog of astronomy there. <laughs> Well, that dog looks really cute. I bet you have hours of good fun playing with it, him, her, whatever it is. Her, her. I have okay. four. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Kim, I would ask you to read uh, 51, but the thing is, you're a little quiet, um, so I'm worried it's going to be hard for me to hear you, and it looks like you've got your hands full. So uh, who's, uh, Judy, are you, do you have your shit together now or what? Yeah, I'm good now. Okay, so what's number 51? So it's called orbital and synodic periods. Use oh. each object. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I didn't have my stuff together. Sorry. Let me know when you want me to keep reading. Uh, and it was, um, I think this is sidereal versus synodic period. Okay, keep, go ahead. <laughs> Use each object's given synodic period and find its actual orbital period. Okay. And then it has three parts. So A would be Saturn and the synodic period equals to 378.1 days. Okay. Do you guys remember those formulas that I gave you earlier? Is Saturn an inner or an outer planet? Outer. So um, we want to do the sidereal period is the synodic period over the synodic period minus one year. The issue is, however, class, that all of our answers, all of our inputs need to be in years. So what are we going to do, Yudi, about this 378.1 days? You would have to convert it into years. Sounds like a you job. Why don't you help me do that using dimensional analysis, okay? Um, Do you like live class? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's read those four steps of dimensional analysis together. So, I think somewhere in your notes, you should have the four steps of dimensional analysis, probably at the first day of class or something, or the second day. Yeah, I'm looking for it. <clears throat> so you write down the number of conversion. So it'd be 378.1 days. And I did that. Times. Um, Year over days. Like a division bar. Okay, yep. year over days. Okay. And then it would be one year. Uh-huh. Over 365.25. Yeah, should we, that's a good question. So we want to get more than three sig figs. Normally I would do one year as 365 days. But you're right, mm -hmm. Yudi. Since I have four sig figs here, I should probably keep two more. I don't want my conversion to pollute my answer. 
the question is, should I use a sidereal year or a or a tropical year? I'm trying to think right now. Um, we want to convert this to sidereal years. So yes, 365.25 is correct. Um, would you want to round that there since that has an extra sig fig or am I just- um, I actually like keeping the extra sig fig so that I'm quite sure that this measurement pollutes my answer. I really don't want my conversions to pollute my answer, especially when I know it to a next digit place. Right. So I'm, I'm actually intentionally keeping one extra so that I know that that's the dirty olive in the martini, okay? Which is a totally mixed metaphor that makes no sense. Okay. Anyways, um, <clears throat> do them up. Tell me what I get to four sig figs. One point zero three five. I like it, and that's years, right? And that's what we're going to put into our equation here. We're going to do one point zero three five years over 1.035 years minus one year. Okay, guys, punch them up. Any day now. 29.57. Uh, in the units? Uh, it's a little tricky because it looks like years cancel out, but it's actually supposed to be times one year. So it, it's still years. Um, let's try part B. What's part B, Udi? Oh, Mercury, the synodic period is equal to 115.9 days. 115.9 days. Okay, we're gonna have the same problem we had last time where we have to convert to years. And we've already done that. So let's go days to years. One year is 365.25 days. Go ahead and give me your synodic period in years. Keep four sig figs. <clears throat> Is that a 115.98? Uh, 115, sorry, what is it supposed to be? I thought I heard nine, but maybe I, do I have to look it up? Jeez. No, it's um, 115.9. Oh, okay. So that's a nine right there. I think he's asking what's after the nine. Yes, I am. Uh, uh, wait, you're asking what that is? Yeah, it just looks like a little smudge to me. Oh, sorry. It looks clear on my end. That's that's days. That's the letter D for days. <laughs> oh, sorry. But yeah, it definitely it didn't look right. <laughs> Does it look smudgy for everyone? It looks crystal. I just think it's a little better. It looked fine for me, but that happened to me earlier when you wrote circumpolar. So you know. I think sometimes the internet starts to get crappy, and they reduce the bit rate of the video. Honestly, I could have better internet considering that I'm teaching this class here, but I wonder if it's my internet or yours. I don't know. Anyways, does anyone have an answer here? 0.3173 years. Oh, if that's Austin, we got, um, you got an email to send me, right? I do, yes. 
Could you do that today after class? I can, yes. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so we have our sidereal, remember Mercury's an inner planet, so we have a slightly different formula this time. We have synodic period over synodic period plus one year, which is 0 0.3173 years over open parentheses, 0 0.3173 years plus one year, close parentheses. What you got? I got uh, 0 0.24 years. Let's keep four sig figs for consistency. You got 0 0.2408. Or I guess if you're rounding, it would be uh, 0 0.9. Okay. So Mercury takes a quarter of a year to go around the sun. But you're right, 0 0.24 years would have been fine. Um, <clears throat> class, you'll remember I was having discussion with Erin earlier. And she said in the previous year, I only did parts A and B and I skipped C. Now that I think about it, we tried an outer planet, we tried an inner planet. What do you say we just call this one done? Because I'm trying to finish up, we'll probably have to go a little over three, but we'll, we'll just call this one done since this is a pretty long ass homework. And then we'll just move on to the final problem. Sound good to everyone? Everyone yeah. like that plan? Sounds good to me. A and B is acceptable. I'm going to erase. Okay, the last problem is a problem using sidereal time. We learned that earlier today, but it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, Jenna, I think we're back to you. Uh, Jenna, will you uh, read me S153? Yep. Um, it says HA equals LST minus RA. And then A says, oh. it's 4 p.m. on the March equinox. What is the local sidereal time? Oh, sidereal time. Sidereal. <laughs> sidereal. OK, this can be pretty confusing. So let's draw a quick little diagram here. Um, I'm going to speed things up. I wonder if that'll be big enough for you guys. And I'm going to draw with my Frisbee a very quick dome. I hope that's big enough for you guys to see. Okay. And this is my meridian. Remember when we do local sidereal time, we like to make a kind of east to west diagram. How the hell can we know the su local sidereal time? What's the definition of local sidereal time? Why don't you guys go back and look that up and read it to me? Right out of your notebook there. It's the hour angle of the spring equinox. Local sidereal time is the hour angle of the spring equinox. Now, what they told me was they told me it was 4 p.m. 4 p.m. tells me where the sun is. Where's the sun in this diagram? It's four hours past meridian. In other words, probably over here somewhere. How does this help me find the LST? For those of you who have fuzzy cameras, I'm just going to try to get close to that for a second. That would give us um, the hour angle, no? That gives us the hour angle of the sun. 
But yeah. what we really need is the hour angle of the spring equinox. Right, right, right. Okay. So where is the spring equinox on the spring equinox? Jeez. Huh. I'm supposed to know where the spring equinox is. That was a Monday thing, right? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Okay. But it's also a today thing, too. Oh, well, yeah. Let's look at a picture from our book. I think I have this here. Let me see if I have the picture. I want the astrometry lecture. I think I have. Uh, there was a slide that in retrospect would have been very, very nice to have. Okay. Well, I don't know. Let's do this one, 34. The sun is traveling the path of the ecliptic shown in purple. On the spring equinox, the sun is here, which implies that on the spring equinox, the sun is on the spring equinox. Know what I mean? On the spring equinox. It's the four o'clock for the spring equinox. Say that again? Isn't it four o'clock for the spring equinox? Uh, right, well, in other words, Kim, the sun is where the spring equinox is. So what would the hour angle of the spring equinox be? What you said pretty much, which is? Four hours. Four hours, good. I didn't like how you said a clock. I like it when you say four hours. The LST is 400 hours. Now, in those cases in physics where you use a diagram to prove your thing, we will say by inspection. By inspection means I drew the diagram and that's how I figured it out. What's part B ask? Wait, I'm kind of confused about that. Sure. Um, um, if you can ask me the right question, I can deconfuse you. But yeah. You can... So I'm trying to figure out is what my question exactly is. Um, your question is, how did I know? Well, your question could be several things. Your question could be, how did I know where the spring equinox was? Or your question yeah. could be, how did I know that the spring equinox was four hours past the meridian? Or your question well, could be, what's the meridian or what's the spring equinox? You know, I don't. Yeah. So, so we know that it's 4 p.m. on the day of the spring equinox. That's what they gave us, right? Right. But it turns so, out that um, on the day of the spring equinox, the sun is located on a point on the sky known as the spring equinox. Here's the thing that you're having trouble with, Ian, and I understand your confusion. The spring equinox is four different things at once. The spring yeah. equinox yeah. is one, a point in Earth's orbit, yes. two, a day of the year, March 21st, uh -huh. three, a point on the sky in the constellation Pisces, and four, a moment in time when the equator lines up with the sun. This yeah. can lead to some hideously confusing questions on exams that go like this. What's the locate? Where is the sun located? Where is the spring equinox located at noon on the spring equinox? I could ask you like wacky shit like that. That yeah. sounds really messy. The problem that you're probably having, Ian, is that you have to think about the fact that, yes, it's 4 p.m. on March 21st, but that means the sun is on the point in Pisces where the spring equinox is. Since well, we keep sidereal time by how many hours past the meridian we are, if the sun is four hours post meridian, the spring equinox is also four hours post meridian. And that's, well, that's what I'm trying to figure. I'm trying to like wrap my head around this. So it's the day of the spring equinox. I got that. Yep. But then why does that make whatever time it is the spring equinox? Because I thought that was going to specifically at like, like we looked it up and it was like this year it's going to be at like 540 something a.m. Okay. Oh, oh. 
that's the uh, that is the moment in time of the spring equinox. Do not. Yeah, that's that. Like, so is that what we're finding? Or no, we're using the point on the sky. Basically, local sidereal time is not keeping track of time by the sun, but yeah. keeping track of time by a rotation of a point on the sky called the spring equinox. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For instance, here's an example. Let's say instead of the spring equinox, they said the fall equinox. That would mean the sun was on the fall equinox. The spring equinox would be over here on the other side of the sky. And that would mean your time was 6, 12 plus 4. Uh, it would be 16 hours. OK. I, I don't think I'm having you know a really what? Probably difference. missing Monday's lecture is also messing you up too, right? Probably. <laughs> so why don't you watch Monday's lecture again and then think about it. And if you need to have a debriefing on this, we can have a special one-on-one -on -one time. Okay. But remember, I can usually help explain things to you provided you can ask me the right question. Yeah, and that was my You did kind of ask me some solid questions. It's just that I, could, I don't feel like my answers are helping that much. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just gonna, I was gonna do the Monday's work like right after I do, did this. Okay, that ought to help. Yeah. Uh, part B, Jenna. Okay, um, the local sidereal time is 1930. When will Vega cross your meridian? Okay, to answer this problem, we're gonna need the right ascension of Vega. And the right ascension of Vega is 18 hours and 35 minutes, I believe. They give it to us in the book. I can also look it up on Wikipedia. It's actually drifted by a little bit, I think, since the Vega star. The right ascension of Vega. OK, 18 hours and 36 minutes, whatever. We'll keep 18.35. OK, here we're going to have to do some math. The hour angle will tell us where on the sky Vega is. Let's compute that first. Keep in mind that when you're dealing with hours and minutes, got to keep them separated, OK? So our angle is um, LST 1930 minus 18 hours and 35 minutes. Who's good at keeping track of time? Can anyone subtract that bad boy for me? Would that just be zero, zero, 0055? Yeah. You could think of it as this is negative five minutes, and subtracting that gives you one hour. One hour minus five minutes gives you 55 minutes. But unfortunately, that's the, not the correct answer to the question. The hour angle tells me that Vega crossed 55 minutes ago. But they asked the question, when will Vega cross next? So what's the answer to that question? When will Vega cross next if it crossed 55 minutes ago and is like right over there? Does anyone understand what I just said? Or are you confused? Wouldn't it be 24 hours? Well, not exactly At 24. point in time? Pl well, plus the, the 55 minutes. Or minus the 55 minutes, right? Three hours and five seconds. Or five minutes. It'll cross in 24 minus 55 minutes, 23 hours and five minutes. That's what it will cross next. Write all that down because I'm going to have to erase it for part C, and then we're all done.
I'm erasing. Last part of the last problem. Jenna, read us out. Part C. You, yep. You observe a star that has an hour angle of 13 hours when the local sidereal time is 8.15. What is the star's right ascension? You said 8.15? Yep, 1.5. Okay, how are your algebra skills, Jenna? Can you rearrange that equation for me? Solve it for right ascension? Yeah. Um, it would be RA equals HA plus LS. Uh, careful. If you uh, add RA to this side, you yeah. then must subtract HA from the other side. So try again. Yeah. Um, RA equals LST minus HA. Good. Okay, so let's stack them up and subtract them out. The LST is eight hours and 15 minutes. The, uh, the hour angle is 1300 hours. I'm guessing this might confuse the bejesus out of some people. So let me show you how I would do it as an example. I keep my hours and minutes separated and then I glue them back together. I have awkward ways of thinking about things. So I don't know if this works for you guys, but I would do 15 minus zero is positive 15 minutes. And then I would do eight minus 13 is negative five hours. But class, what do you get if you have negative five hours and you add 15 minutes back into it? That would be negative 445, right? And that's how I would do this, negative 445. Now, the only issue is we determined that right ascension is minus 445, but normally we do not express right ascensions in this manner. You will remember that right ascension is defined as hours east of the spring equinox. What does it mean if we have a negative in front of it? Would that be hours west? Correct, but that's not how right ascension should be expressed. So we now have to figure out how to convert it back into an eastward right ascension. To do that, we can do 24 hours minus 445. This time we're subtracting the hours and the minutes, so be careful there. Why don't you guys see if you can use my methods? What do you get? Nineteen fifteen. Very good. And that's our final answer. Whew. No word to lie, guys. That was a wee bit of a doozy. Okay. That homework. <laughs> that homework was always going to be tough. Celestial coordinates are some of the trickiest stuff in the class. Next week's homework will be way easier. And then the week after that is going to get harder again. And then it should get easier all the way to the end. But such is life. Luckily, uh, Ian, the, the lab isn't too long to, uh, for this week. So you should get on that, OK? It is great news. Thank you. <laughs> um, didn't I don't remember it being that long, but we'll see. Uh, OK. Uh, does everyone feel good? Okay, I feel good. So uh, I'll try to have this video up uh, in an hour and a half or so whenever it finishes rendering. Uh, until then, live long and prosper. I'll see you guys next Monday, okay? Okay, bye.